some people folks think I have not been there for that whole time. But uh, initially, the wire pool maintained an inventory of wire open cable and distributed them. We didn't do any anything else. But then along came Appendix A and the scope of the wire pool expanded greatly. And I have to say that I have learned a lot from marine techs and hearing about the issues that y'all run into. I, I don't claim to have uh, any of the, all the answers, certainly not all the answers. Um, it's, uh, there are so many variables that it's often difficult and sometimes impossible to determine why things happened the way they did, but that doesn't mean we can't try. So I've pulled together a few a few uh, things to talk about. Of course, I can't advance my screen. Why would that be? Um, let's see. Can you go ahead and put it into full there we screen? Go. Okay, yeah. And is there any way you could uh, put it into full screen mode? We just got full, a question. Full screen. Oh boy. What do you? Uh, I'm not a Mac user, so I think, I, I think ahead. it might be just the green button or the yellow button in the top left corner there. Oh, up here. Okay. Not the red one. The red one will close it. I know that. But one of those is for full screen. There we go. How's that? That looks great. Okay, good. So the thought is that uh, I pulled a couple of things to talk about that don't always go as we think they should. And in some cases, uh, I've got uh, some suggestions on ways that might help going forward. So we're gonna talk about some testing, uh, our favorite subject of wire logs, possibly some advantages of using what I'm referring to as wire in. Uh, there'll be a brief cover of what some additions to, recent additions to Appendix A, wire and cable maintenance, uh, just a, a, a bunch of slides, so pictures showing that not all thimbles are created equal, and a little bit of talk about uh, grooved shells, level wine problems, and how we're trying to deal with, uh, with that going forward. So in, in the case of testing, Appendix A uh, came out with the requirement for testing. And this is a little bit different than some people might be familiar with. Previously, uh, if you worked with a factor of safety of five or greater, you didn't need to do any testing. You just need to pull your uh, safety, uh, your tension members to a certain load that they were expected to see. But now all tension members have to be tested and break tested. And it, the frequency of that testing depends on what the factor of safety is that uh, you're working with. So factor of safety greater than or equal to 2.5, you can test every two years. Between 1.5 and 2.5, you have to test annually. Now, even though you may only have to test every two years, the wire pool is happy to test it uh, annually as well, if you're working with a factor of safety greater than, than uh, 2.5. Uh, so in order to get the tension member tested, You've got to submit a break test request, which you can do via the Wirepool database. And this puts uh, us, the Wirepool, on notice that you'll be sent, that we'll be receiving a sample. So we we get this uh, we get this information that you're going to be sending us a sample, and then you need to send us a seven meter sample with. Now this is also a bit new, with at least one end terminated with the fittings that you're using in the field. So we have we receive a lot of a lot of samples that don't have any terminations and we end up terminating both. And we don't mind doing that and we will do that if your um, sample or a portion of your sample uh, doesn't break as high as uh, the minimum the manufacturer's minimum breaking strength. And we're, we will do that, we'll terminate it. But the real advantage to sending us a sample with one end terminated 
is that you get to see how well your terminations fare in comparison to the strength of the wire. I mean, ideally, we'd always like to get a mid-span break, but that doesn't always the case. And we have um, numerous examples of where the, the vessel applied termination is what is the limiting factor. And we can we will log that information in the database. But what we'll also do if the sample was long enough. So if you sent us a, for example, if you sent us a, uh, say a 30 foot sample or whatever that works out to be 10 meters, 10 meter sample, that gives us enough to do a couple tests. And so if one end of that 30 foot sample has a, a vessel applied termination on it, we still have enough left over to produce another sample with both of our terminate with a wire pool applied terminations and we'll break that. And the one that we get the highest, you know, if we get the if we get the high break with our terminations, with the wire pool terminations, that is, we will go ahead and enter that into the database. And that would be your um, you know, that would be the assigned breaking load, or not the it would be the manufacturer's minimum that would get uploaded, but you wouldn't be penalized with a low, low break. And then in addition to the sample, um, once, once you put in a request, you get in the, you get, we get notified, but we don't put you in the queue until you get sample to us. So what sometimes happens is people uh, get in the, uh, send us a break test request, but we never get their sample. And so I could, there's a couple of cases where that has happened, but uh, it, we can't do anything without your sample and you don't get into the queue until we receive the sample. Now, in addition to, um, in addition to getting the sample, which I remind you really needs to be well identified. We get a lot of samples in and we wanna make sure that we know exactly where that sample came from. So that sample should have the uh, NSF number or OTH number. And it would also, we also ask that you send a copy of the break test request with the sample, just so we keep everything straight. So in addition to all that, Appendix A says that you're submit, you should submit a wire log and you can do that via the wire pool database. You can upload it uh, as a, and we get that and I take a look at it and if it looks like it's correct, then I approve it. And then it goes on to the, the page for that particular tension member. Now, talking about wire logs, there are certain requirements for wire logs as per Appendix A. And it says the minimum requirements are supposed to have the uh, wire identifier, which will be an NSF number or an OTH number. You should also have on the wire log or with the wire log, the winch, the manufacturer of the winch and model on which that tension member is used. And as well, a description of the shiv train. Now we, we are very, we'll take whatever you got, but I've got some examples here. Uh, here's one that came in from the Endeavor, very nice. It has every shiv, the diameter of those shivs or the, um, the tread diameter. It has uh, the number of traction heads, uh, sh traction shivs, nice presentation of what the shiv train looks like for their particular winch number three. We'll, we also have seen uh, more of a description script. So this is for the Ravel. And so there's a bit, a bit of a description there on what the, uh, what the ship train looks like. That's fine. But we don't get a lot of ship train descriptions. So I'm kind of encouraging you to include that. You could do it once uh, and put it with your wire log or you know, have it an, as an attachment to your wire log and that will work out just fine. The, uh, let's see, oh, going on, continuing on, and this is where things get really a little flaky, is that the wire log should contain the number of deployments since the last break test. So how many deployments 
have there been since the last break test? And by deployments, I mean casts or however the however this particular tension member is being used. And then for each of those deployments, for each of those casts, the maximum tension that occurred during the cast, the wire out, we're gonna talk a little bit more about wire out at the time of maximum tension and the maximum wire out for each deployment. So this is what Appendix A is expecting to get or is, expects the users to provide for a wire log. And I can say that there is probably, I can't even, maybe one or two ships, I can't even say that that's the case where all of these things are included in their wire log. And as you can imagine, we get all kinds of wire logs. Here's one, which is more of a summary. Um, some of you may recognize this. Uh, it just uh, doesn't, doesn't meet all of the requirements that are expected for a wire log. It looks great, it's a nice summary, but it doesn't have all the information that's needed. It doesn't have every each cast that's on there. Here's a, another example. This happens to be the Kilimanjaro. They have um, the maximum wire out, the maximum tension, but they don't have the wire out at the time of max tension. So it's almost there, it's getting there, but not everything is there. It's nice to read, it's easy to read for sure. And we can scan down and see what those maximum tensions were, see if there's any issues that might be with the, since the last break test. Here's another uh, version. This is, uh, this is again a summary on the left-hand side. But then the details, the handwritten details appear on the right hand side. And sometimes that's a little bit difficult to uh, interpret, but it does, none of these, neither of these have the uh, max or the wire out at max tension. So I, I kind of alluded early on that we wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about wire in. And I throw it out there as a consideration for an additional measurement that we ought to be thinking about um, as including in a, a, an additional parameter, let's say that. So a useful parameter, uh, since F, we're, we're very familiar with wire out and that's a very useful parameter. I'm not suggesting that we do away with it, but it, uh, you know, after, after an instrument depth is zeroed at the surface, we can then compare this parameter wire out with water depth. So where are we within the water column? Good, very good parameter. But another parameter that I'd like us to consider using is wire in or wire inboard. So it's, uh, it's the length of wire that would remain on the ship during a cast. Now, the reference for wire in is at the end, uh, is the end that is at the core of the winch drum. So wire in is equal to the total length of wire minus the wire out. The wire in reference uh, seldom changes unless we're going to end for end the wire. It usually remains uh, at the core of the winch drum. Now, consider, consider the following scenario. And we have a tension member say that's 7,500 meters long. We get some kind of an event Let's call it a high tension event for right now, but it's an, an event that concerns us a little bit and we wanna keep track of the location of that event. And for us, it occurred when there was 500 meters of wire out. So we had 7,000 meters of wire in. Now, over time, retermination, cutbacks, 
uh, every few months or you know however often it happens um, and with each cutback it uh, reduces the length of the tension member now the reference point for wire out is always the wet end how much wire was in the water using wire out only wire out it's difficult to keep track of where that tension event occurred along the length of the, of the tension member and the reason is is that the reference point is always changing wires getting shorter the reference point and so it's a it can be a big bookkeeping ordeal to try to remember where that tension event occurs and eventually you forget about it you forget about trying to keep track of it i suspect if we were to use wire in that tension event remains relative to the to the dry end the winch core end and after a period of time that location of that tension event may eventually go away so if we know that the tension event occurred at 7000 meters wire in when that tension member is no longer you know is equal to or less than 7000 meters it's probably no longer a concern but we took one measurement or we we noted one parameter wire in and it will carry on through until that wire is no longer or is less than 7000 meters this will be you know we have to up our game i think with regard to wire logs particularly as we begin to use uh more synthetics because we're want, we're going to want to keep a good record of how these synthetics are being used and um the more information that we have the better off in terms of evaluating the condition of these tension members so i throw that out as a possibility for uh an additional parameter that we might want to think about having So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some other recent changes and additions to the uh, research vessel safety standard, Appendix A in the, in the research vessel safety standard. So in November of 2022, and then again in June 2023, there were some changes and additions made. And many, some of these are good because it gives you, it gives the text some and and the vessel operators a little bit of uh backing when uh science comes on board and in this particular case tension members that are covered by appendix a have always been those which were purchased and distributed by the nsf wire pool and they are also those tension members that may have been acquired independently by the vessel and it is for for those um it was it's those are the tension members that we we call uh they have an oth number not an ohs number i just what the heck was i thinking about all right oh they're part of an over overboard handling system so i'm sorry the tension members that were acquired independently by the vessel are given a number a, a, a identifier that begins with OTH, whereas those that were purchased and distributed by the wire pool have an NSF number. And what is now added or included in the Appendix A are that have to to have to um, uh, where where Appendix A applies are those tension members that are brought on board by any science party or outside organization and that are used as part of the overboard handling system. So anybody who comes on board with a tension member that's gonna be part of an overboard handling system now have to have the tests, uh, te break, te break strength tests and wire pool will, will, will do this. We just need to have enough advance notice to have that done. Um, also, it would be good if, there, if a wire log existed for how they've used this in the past. Is it new? Have they beat it to heck? 
and really can't be uh, is not a good tension member, but we'll we'll certainly hopefully prove some of that depending on the uh, on the brake test results. The uh, specific requirements for steel tension members uh, continues to be depend on the factor of safety which with with which they're going to be used, and that's all defined in tables A eight one through four. So that, that all that re remains, but now these tension members brought on by other science party need to also be included as well. The uh, tension, uh, synthetic tension members, I guess the, the, the short term, short answer is that Tension, uh, synthetic tension members should be used with a factor of safety five or greater. And we are recommending a D over D ratio of 40. And there is a new table on how they're to be used. So that, you know, without any other information, synthetic tension members factor of safety of five. However, we can refine that provided we're given enough time to uh, do a little bit of homework. And we need to have good tension member history. This is why the logs for tension synthetics is very important. Um, we also, knowing the overboarding configuration, the expected loading for a particular cruise, or a particular application um, and the proposed operation, along with that good history, that wire log, we can go to the manufacturer and they can utilize their laboratory data that they've collected on the performance of these uh, ropes and determine if given all that information, whether a lower factor of safety can be utilized. Now, We've worked or we, we are, we have zeroed in on a preferred manufacturer of these synthetics and the uh, regional class research vessels have purchased the synthetics from Cortland and the wire pool has purchased uh, synthetics from Cortland. And we found that their uh, engineering staff has been uh, very helpful and are willing to work with us to determine if a particular operation can take place with a lower factor of safety. Um, having a single manufacturer, there are lots of rope manufacturers out there, I realize that. And this is not unlike having a single manufacturer for 322 or 681 or even the uh, three by 19 torque balance wire. So we're zeroing in on a single manufacturer. We're working with Cortland. They've provided us with good engineering support. And although the uh, Appendix A is saying we need to work with a factor of safety for synthetics, there are options for trying to get that factor of safety lower. We did this for the uh, Neil Armstrong when they were using the uh, 9 16 uh, Heiko plasma, and we were able to work at a lower factor of safety, given the fact that, that we had an idea what, what the tensions were going to be, the number of operations that were gonna take place, what the shiv train looked like. And in that, in that case, we got it down to an acceptable level so that they could do their science the way that they wanted to carry it out. And this was, a coring operation that took place in the Puerto Rico Trench in 8,000 meters of water. So that worked out fine. The, the one caveat here is that it takes time to work with the manufacturer and to work out these details. And we will over time build up some experience with these. And the hope is that uh, with that experience, we can be a little more definitive with our uh, factors of safety, but for now, it is important 
to allow time to do this if a factor of safety of five isn't gonna, gonna hack it. So again, this is, this is a, a, a change, an addition to Appendix A, Appendix A. It's a start. And so we had nothing about synthetics. We wanted to get something in there. And I know that over time, this will definitely be changing, but this is the way it stands uh, for now. Rick, uh, quickly before you move on, do you mind explaining what the D over D ratio is? Sure. The D over D ratio is the ratio of the uh, diameter of the, the tread diameter of the uh, smallest shiv in the shiv train. It's a ratio of the tread diameter to the uh, diameter of the tension member. So the, of the synthetic rope. Now, many, uh, I, I'm gonna wade into this. I, I, I don't think I wanna wade too far into it, but the manufacturer does have or does recommend a DOD ratio of 30 as being acceptable. However, one of the reasons why well, it, it's not uncommon with the uh, wires and the existing ship trains that we are working with a factor of safety or rather a D over D of 40 or greater. And so the thought was, well, if we're going to be introducing some synthetics, not necessarily on new ships, but if we're gonna be introducing synthetics on existing systems, it would not be outrageous to expect that size for size, the D over D is going to be close to 40 already. And what we learned that what we what we were doing on the Armstrong was that we were using 916 rope on the same overboarding shifts that were used to deploy 681. And so we had a very large um, shiv diameter. They were 48 inches divided by the, the 916. So we were had a very large D over D ratio. And because we had that large D over D ratio, the manufacturer agreed that we could we could work at a lower factor of safety. It just that higher D over D number reduces or increases the life of the rope. There's less um, deterioration of the rope itself when you're working with high D over Ds. So we tried to keep it up around 40, thinking that that's pretty much what's out there on the ships. And it'll allow us better opportunities to reduce the factor of safety and get the science done. Okay, so let's see what happens now. All right, wire and cable maintenance. So as a condition, as a condition of accepting wire from the wire pool, which is a NSF asset, there are certain agreements. And one of those is that vessel operators need to maintain this wire cable. And there are other requirements such as uh, storing it properly. And, uh, but we're gonna focus on maintenance. And the, like any piece of machinery and wire cable are simple machines, the frequency of maintenance needs to increase the older the tension member gets. So we gotta baby it. The older it gets, it needs to be babied a little bit more. And maintenance means there that the we're we're um, rinsing the salt water salt water off of uh, the cable during rehaul, and that frequency we understand that that frequency depends on the availability availability of fresh water, but I think there's a minimum requirement of at least uh, once a cruise, and uh, at least once. No, an interval no greater than 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 thirty days. I believe that's the. Uh, I should I should have looked that up. But so there's a frequency of of uh, 
rehaul. And I know a lot of people, a lot of ships are rinsing as the wire comes on board. That's great. The other, uh, the other factor, other part of maintenance is the application of a lubricant or cor corrosion inhibitor. And that product that's used has to meet uh, US EPA requirements for a vessel that issued in the vessel general permit for discharges incidental to normal operations. So it has to meet certain requirements. And basically that lubricant and corrosion inhibitor uh, has to be environmentally acceptable. And with minimal toxicity and biodegradable and non-bioaccumulative. And so these manufacturers of these products they have them listed as whether they're uh, VGP, uh, EAL, environmentally acceptable lubricants. Now, we get down to how often. The minimum frequency stated in the maintenance policy is once every 12 months. And I'll tell you, that is woefully inadequate. That is not going to maintain that cable. However, that's what the that's what the policy states. If it can be done more often, and I would I would argue that it should be done more often, um, and we'll get on to why it should possibly be done more often. But uh, I've been an advocate for trying to lubricate at sea. Instead of doing it in port, and off spooling, you know, the entire length and then spooling it back on. The thought is that could we increase the frequency that we're doing lubrication by doing it at sea? Once a cruise, deepest station, whatever would work best. I don't have, but we need to try it, I think, and see if that increases the uh, longevity of the cable. Grignard developed a product called OLLD2, or another name for it is StrandCore. And they, that product has been recommended early on because it had great success, but the great success was because it was applied frequently. And we uh, have have uh, had discussions with Grignard, and I know that they are now aware of how often we can actually do it or not do it. And they're recommending a different product, which is also a VGP EAL lubricant, and that's the uh, their Prelube 19 product. And I know that uh, Chris Greiner has applied it on some uh, on some wires, maybe a wire or two, I'm not sure. Scripps wanted to try it as well. And Grignard recommends it given the rather infrequent lubrication that we are currently using. So that's uh, that's where we stand with with lubrication. Rick. Do you mind answering the question um, where the maintenance policy can be found? Is it in um, RVSS Appendix A? The maintenance, that's a good question. Where is the maintenance policy? I know that there is a copy of it on the Wirepool website. So, There's a copy of it there for sure. And I believe it may be, there are other resources and you'd have to check me on that, but I believe the RBSS safety committee has resources listed and I'm not sure whether the maintenance policy is listed there as well. But, uh, so I, I can't answer that definitively. It does, it is a few places. And I, if it's, I believe it's on, on our website and if it's not there, it should be. And I'll check to make sure it is there. 
I did just find it and uh, put it in the chat. You did. You did find it. I found it on your website on oh, the good. on the Witchpool website, and I um, included the link in the chat for everyone. Hopefully, that was the Wirepool website, but uh, I I think so. Okay. So. Good. All right. So where are we here? All right. Okay. So you're probably all familiar with this, but uh, picture on the left is the core lube applicator that many vessels are using. The uh, the picture in the middle shows how it opens up and you can place it mid wire and there are brushes inside it gets uh, the applicator gets uh, attached to the pump which is shown on the right hand side and the newer pumps i'm told though i i, I must admit i have never um I've never, we've never lubricated with the pre-lube 19, but the newer pumps I believe can do both. And I know Chris uh, Griner purchased new hoses to be used with the pre-lube, different hoses to be used with the pre-lube 19 uh, than he's been using with the OLLD2. Um, I believe also that you have to be a little more diligent in cleaning the applicator with the pre-lube 19, but uh, it gets cleaned out anyway. But both applic the applicators can be used for both. It's just a case of uh, maybe the hoses and the, you know, the lubricant, the, the comes in a bucket and that there's a siphon kind of hose that goes there into the, the bucket and then it gets fed into the pump and the pump feeds it to the applicator. So that's what uh, those fellows look like. Now, things don't always go as planned. And I don't want this to be a discourage. I don't want to see this photo as a reason why you shouldn't be lubricating on the left. But this is a case uh, of lubricating and we were getting, I got inundated with this Play-Doh kind of material uh, that you see on the right there. It's, uh, it came out of these, some 322 cables and maybe others as well, I don't recall. But the reason why this was, is extruding, and I guess it's continuing to come out of some cables as I speak, is because in the in the production process at the manufacturing level, they are using a VGP grease, whereas the OLLD2 or the Prelube 19, those are field dressings. That's what we can put on in the field. But the VGP grease is applied during the closing process of manufacturing the uh, 322 or 681 cables. And it turns out that they really didn't have a specification for how much of this VGB, VGP grease should be uh, extruded or, or pumped into during the closing process. They have since corrected that. And this is due to, this is occurring due to an excess application by the manufacturer. And so it comes out, as you can see at the end of the uh, core lube uh, collar, and it's a gooey mess. And I have gotten plenty of it over time, but that has hopefully been resolved uh, by the manufacturer. They now have a specification for how much of that should be applied. And it just raises havoc with, uh, with your overboarding equipment, your shivs, uh, in this case, the lubricant. So uh, hopefully that's been, uh, I sympathize with everyone in the field who's having to deal with this, but uh, I hope going forward, it's been taken care of. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about thimbles, not, uh, and and thimbles and, and, and the uh, value of some of, of testing vessel applied terminations. 
So here's a test that we did on a uh, three eighths wire rope. It was a break test request. We we broke it, and this was the result. Now this is very unusual. This was a very unusual break, and it kind of caught my attention because what we would normally see would be that the failure would occur not at that point, but in the main part of the sample at the base of that Nyko press fitting. So, okay, we got that, we noted it, we reported it, but it still kind of sat in my memory. And we did a little bit of investigation about thimbles. So here's a standard wire rope thimble, three quarter inch uh, G411. Okay, looks pretty good, but not so much when you compare it with an extra heavy wire thimble, much bigger, able to take greater loads. And I certainly, I know in the mooring business, we are always using the heavy wire rope thimbles for all of our synthetic terminations. And I encourage the vessels to do the same. And the reason, so we go along here, we, uh, here's, the, here's what the manufacturer says, that the standard thimbles are for light duty service, whereas the heavy wire rope thimbles are for heavy duty service. So standard sounds like it ought to be kind of normal operations, but in fact, they ought to call it the light duty wire rope thimble. And it's not obvious until you see the, see the two next to each other. So here's, we, we did a little testing and here's a quarter inch piece of wire terminated with a Nyko press, has a heavy wire rope thimble on the left and a uh, standard wire rope thimble on the right, hold until the wire started to break. And you can see how the standard thimbles just collapse under load. Here's a little close up of the, of the break as it occurred because the, the uh, radius drops down pretty small and the wires part, individual wires part. Now, what happened, you, I've showed you the, uh, I showed you the slide on the, the picture on the right. That was from an actual brake test. And that was with a standard thimble. Some period of time later, we got another break, this time on 9 16 wire that looked just like what we recalled that 3 8 wire looking like. So although we cannot say definitively, given the nature of what the break looks like, it really appears that quite possibly a standard thimble was probably used on that 916 wire that came under load, that radius of the bend got really tight and it parted. Of course, we don't get the thimble back, the thimble went away, but because of the signature of the break, it looks like it may have, that may have been the cause. So a couple of things here, the real advantage to getting a sample that is terminated by the vessel or by the operators so that you can see how it fares under load, number one. And also it helps to identify these kind of things that might crop up that we weren't thinking about initially. And it came to light after we started to look into kind of the different flavors of, of thimbles. Okay, grooved shells, um, sometimes known as Liebus shells, because Liebus uh, developed them. They're, uh, they're called shells because they are bolted to the core of a winch drum and they improve the level winding. So they 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 keep the, they produce a good foundation from which to start, and it's critical that the shell pitch diameter the the 
that each of those grooves be slightly greater than the cable diameter and by about a half to 3%. So in order to start with a good foundation, you really need to have appropriate, have a good match between the diameter of your cable and the shell pitch diameter. So in the past, the way we've been working is that a vessel operator would request a new cable and the next cable that was in line uh, is I identified and distributed to the vessel. Okay. This was like, this is the first in, first out approach. We would often be asked for a uh, sample to be taken from the designated cable, sometimes uh, before the before the wire pool shipped, shipped the cable. And it would either be sent to the winch manufacturer, which would often be Markey, or if time was short, they'd ask us to send it to Liebus. And at Liebus, Liebus International, they would tension the cable and uh, make diameter measurements at a variety of tensions, preset tension loads, up to about 5,000 pounds. They would then they in turn would, would send that information to the winch manufacturer and they would then determine if the designated cable can be used with existing grooved shells or if new shells were required. And often it seemed that the wire that was being distributed and the existing shells didn't match up and new shells would be required, which takes time and of course, money. So we have kind of revamped that approach. Modified approach now is to take all of the 322 cables to begin with are pre-stressed at the manufacturer, by the manufacturer to 5,000 pounds prior to us getting the wire. And this is to improve the diameter uniformity throughout the length of the cable. So they run the 10,000 meters through pre-stressed prior to delivery. We are now sending samples to Levis for every cable, for every 322 we have. We send a sample to Levis for diameter measurements at the various loads at the time we get it into inventory. So instead of distributing a 322 cable that based on the first in first out approach, we are going to, I can't say we've done this yet, we are going to try to match the diameter of the cable with the vessel's existing shells. So Here's where, the, here's where the rub comes. You need to know what your vessel has for its shell and what the, what the, uh, the, number, of, the number of grooves per width. And you may not, it's usually an integer or an inch, integer and a half of the uh, number. So like 116 or 115 and a half or 116 and a half say for a 38 inch diameter uh, wide winch drum. And we will try to get a good match, uh, an acceptable match, one that Levis, for example, will would support so that you can use an exist, you can use it. We match the cable with the shells, hopefully to save time and also money. And as I said, this extra step means that we, one of my first questions to you, if we are asked for, uh, if, you're at, if we're asked for a new wire, will be how many grooves, what's the, what's, the shell, what's the shell configuration? And so it'll only work if we know that. And so going forward, you really, you really need to pay attention to what that shell configuration is.
and the manufacturer, the winch manufacturer, if they're the ones that provided them the last, uh, would probably be a good source of information uh, with that regard. So it's an effort to hopefully save time and some money. So I think I've I've talked enough here. I'm running, my voice is running out. Oh, no. So the challenges with this approach is that the cable diameter has to be uniform or has to have some uniformity throughout the entire length. And the diameter has to be stable from the time the diameter measurements are made initially throughout the life of the cable. So if there's corrosion, it can cause the, the wire to swell and that's gonna affect, affect rather, that's gonna affect its ability to level wind properly. And so how do we work to keep that corrosion at a, you know, uh, in, in check? Not necessarily prevented completely, but is to uh, be maintaining the cable and applying the corrosion inhibitors as we want, but probably more often than we're currently doing. It. So um, otherwise level winding will continue to plague us and it certainly plagues me. And I know you have questions about it often. We don't always have all the answers, but uh, this would, I think this is gonna help uh, doing the, the pre-stressing and uh, obviously some good maintenance throughout the life of the cable. Okay, so here's some contact information. If, uh, if you have uh, questions or want to get in touch with me, it's my office number, email address. Also, uh, I'm currently in the office uh, two days a week now. So I try to answer all, all the emails that I get or concerns or questions. But my point to mentioning that is I, if I don't get back to you right away, it'll probably, I will get back to you in a day or so. So that's uh, that's what I have. And I guess uh, if there's any other questions or questions, I'd be happy to try to